Well, primarily it's because when I finished medical school in Belgium, I was there for seven years at the Free University of Brussels. And when I came back to the United States and did my internal medicine training uh, in New York City with um, Mount Sinai Services, what happens is, is I was offered a job in upstate New York, about two hours north of New York City. It's in Dutchess County, New York. Uh, and in the Hudson Valley where I moved, I did not realize at the time that it was one of the largest Lyme endemic areas in the United States. So what happens is, is that as a bird certified internist, of course, I learned about infectious diseases. I learned how to take a proper history and do a differential diagnosis. Uh, but I was forced to actually examine Lyme and tick-borne diseases because so many of my patients were coming in with either erythema migrans rashes, the classic rash of Lyme disease, um, or just sick with fatigue, joint aches, muscle aches, memory concentration problems, or drenching night sweats, which eventually ended up being Babesia. I was the first doctor to diagnose it. So I was really just forced to look for answers for my patients because they were sick and suffering. And when I was finishing medical school, a story I, I like to tell people is I was studying uh, meditation with my Tibetan Buddhist teachers in Brussels. And I asked Lama Gendon the most important thing he wanted to share with me when I was getting out of medical school. And what he said to me is, Richard, if you put yourself in people's shoes and you do for them what you would want done for yourself, everything will go well. So that's really all I did was to put myself in people's shoes and say, listen, they're sick. I sent them to infectious disease doctors. I sent them to rheumatologists, neurologists, cardiologists. No one had answers. This was back uh, in the early 1980s, um, going into the early 1990s. So I had to really find the solutions myself. And that's how I got into uh, diagnosing and treating Lyme. I would read the medical literature, go to conferences, and ultimately started publishing on it myself. So the, the controversy in Lyme disease, the, the reason that the controversy exists and why so many patients um, do not receive a correct diagnosis and treatment is because even though I have treated 13,000 patients over my professional life, there are many doctors, first of all, that really only see a handful of patients from time to time or don't recognize they have it. But most of the, I'd say, um, problems right now is more political than it is medical. And that is because there are two different guidelines for the diagnosis and treatment of Lyme disease. One is by the Infectious Disease Society of America, uh, or IDSA, and the other one is by the International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society, or ILADS, of which I was one of the founding members. So these two guidelines completely vary in their diagnostic and treatment recommendations. So for example, the IDSA says that it's easy to diagnose and it's easy to treat. And if you don't have a positive two-tiered test, where you have a positive ELISA, followed by five bands on a Western blot, IgG, or appropriate bands on an IgM, you can't possibly have Lyme, whereas the ILADS guidelines say the opposite, which is the tests are not reliable. You could have a negative test by two-tier testing and still have Lyme. Uh, so basically what's happened over the years is that the infectious disease doctors uh, put out their own guidelines, but really this only represents a small percentage of the doctors who are treating. Most of us who are treating right now are internists, family doctors, not just infectious disease physicians. So it, it really does devolved into a political problem over the years, because if you look at the science, not the politics, the science basically says that the two-tier test only has about roughly a 50% chance of picking it up. And part of the reason is because there are at least 18 different pathogenic species of Borrelia. So if you're doing a test that only looks for one species. Um, the United States, it's Borrelia sensu strictu. In Europe, it would be uh, Borrelia afzelii that causes acrodermatitis chronica metrophicans or Borrelia garinii that causes neuroborreliosis. Those are not found on a normal ELISA. You need a C6 ELISA. Um, and even the C6 ELISA we find can still miss it. So, you know, the tests are just not that reliable. There is better testing out there, but ultimately it is the politics 
um, I think that is interfering with patients getting better more than anything else. Yeah, so we know that the laboratory tests for Lyme disease and co-infections are just not accurate as we just discussed. And what that leads to is that the disease becomes severely underdiagnosed in many countries, um, especially in Italy. And I've been to Italy many times. Uh, my wife is Italian um, and she did suffer from chronic Lyme for many years and is now completely well uh, with Dapsone combination therapy, which we'll discuss briefly. So um, years ago, because I recognized that the testing was unreliable. I developed a questionnaire, which I refer to as the Horowitz MSIDS questionnaire or HMQ. And we published this questionnaire in the International Journal of General Medicine. This was back in 2017 with researchers from the State University of New Paltz, Dr. Mary Ella Satara and Dr. Phyllis Freeman. And we, we evaluated this questionnaire in 1600 people from three medical practices, some were sick, uh, some were patients who were well, just to find out whether it was a reliable questionnaire and could accurately diagnose it. And what we found is that the Lyme testing, as we discussed, has roughly a 50% chance of picking it up. It, it's actually 56%. And the Horowitz MSIDS questionnaire has an 87% chance of picking it up. And we showed that in fact is a reliable uh, tool statistically it had three different variables that showed it was reliable. So um, you can find the questionnaire on my website. My website is www.cangetbetter.com, C-A-N-G-E-T-B-E-T-T-E-R, cangetbetter.com. And if you look under the symptom tab, you'll find the questionnaire. You can download it as a PDF and you can take it. And if the score on the questionnaire is greater than 63, that means that you have a very high likelihood of having Lyme disease. It's two standard deviations above the mean. If your score is between 45 and 62, you have a moderate chance of having Lyme disease. And if your score is between 25 and 41, you have somewhat of a chance, right? A mild chance of having Lyme disease. Uh, the patients who are negative usually scored below 25. So it's a good pretest screening tool. So if someone is thinking, um, I have a multi-systemic illness. I have good and bad days where the symptoms come and go. Um, I have migratory joint pain, migratory muscle pain, and or migratory nerve pain, which is tingling, numbness, burning sensations, stabbing feelings. Uh, those are, that is neuropathy symptoms. If those move around the body, that is the hallmark of chronic Lyme. There's only seven diseases in medicine that cause migratory pain, and Lyme is one of them. So if you score high on the questionnaire and you have migratory pain, um, especially nerve pain that migrates around the body, and questions one and 22 relate to Babesia, a tick-borne parasite. Uh, if you have day sweats, night sweats, chills, flushing, air hunger, difficulty catching your breath, uh, or a cough that cannot be explained, those are questions one and 22 on the questionnaire and tells the diagnostician that there's a high likelihood you may have Babesia along with Lyme. So it's a very easy questionnaire to do, and it tells your doctor what is the likelihood of having Lyme and that they may need to do more testing. The, the question about the, you know, the therapies that are now available for Lyme disease and the fact that it is contentious, um, again, going back to the guidelines, the IDSA guidelines, the newest ones, do not even have an answer for those suffering from chronic Lyme. They have no therapies at all that they're recommending. So, you know, after having seen 13,000 chronically ill patients over the last 35, 40 years, um, about eight or nine years ago, researchers from university hospitals in the United States, like John Hopkins University, Stanford University, the University of New Haven, uh, Northeastern University, they came up with the conclusion that Lyme is a biofilm uh, bacteria. And what this means is, is that the bacteria is under biofilms and it hides therefore from the immune system and from the antibiotics getting in to kill the bacteria. So <clears throat> once we found out that Lyme was a persistent bacteria and we knew, we knew it persisted, we just didn't know that it was a persister bacteria like tuberculosis or leprosy, which are also persister bacteria. 
So I looked at the drugs that I had used in my internal medicine residency, because I was uh, doing medicine at the time during the HIV epidemic in the 1980s, and I had used tuberculosis drugs like rifampin, pyrazinamide, INH. So I had experience using these drugs, but I was looking for an excuse to use them in Lyme once we found out that it was a persister bacteria. So when I looked at the different medicines, I came across Dapsone. And Dapsone, as you had mentioned, has been used for a very long period of time against leprosy. In fact, the cure for leprosy, uh, if it's not multi-drug resistant, is using rifampin and Dapsone. So back in 2015, I started using it and saw positive results. So I published my first study on Dapsone combination therapy using rifampin and Dapsone that, that's used for leprosy and just adding a tetracycline like doxycycline or minocycline. And we had excellent results. So I published that in 2016. And from then on, I've now published uh, eight and my ninth study is about to come out on Dapsone. And what we found is, is that Dapsone combination therapy is highly effective against killing Borrelia. So in patients that do not have active Babesia or active Bartonella, and Bartonella is another infection we're finding in most of our patients. Um, it was shown to be in ticks both in Europe and in the United States. There was only one study um, in uh, Ixodes ricinus ticks in Europe that showed there was a species of Bartonella, Bartonella bertolesi, that could be transmitted by ticks. But whether it's transmitted by ticks or it's getting into people from uh, cat scratches or mites or fleas or bites, uh, spider bites, red ants, there's many different vectors. The fact is, is Bartonella with Babesia and Lyme are now showing up in the vast majority of our patients. And Dapsone combination therapy, which is a two month protocol, it's eight weeks of oral generic antibiotics, followed by four days of high dose Dapsone, if people do not have Babesia and Bartonella, looks like it is curing Lyme disease, meaning people are going into remission for very long periods of time. Now, the only reason we suspect that we may actually have a cure is Monica Embers from the University of Tulane. She published last year in uh, the animal model in mice that when you give rifampin and Dapsone, it cures Borrelia Lyme disease in the mouse model. And when we published uh, an article several years ago, it was about four years ago, um, with Dr. Shapi's group from the University of New Haven, we showed in culture that for Borrelia, if you gave rifampin and Dapsone, that Dapsone alone killed Borrelia in its biofilm form. But if you added rifampin, it was even more effective. If you added a tetracycline like doxy, it made it even more effective. And the most effective was combination therapy with four different drugs, doxycycline, azithromycin, a macrolide, rifampin and Dapsone. So the more antibiotics you used, the more effective it was against these biofilm persister forms of Borrelia. And that is what we're finding is working in patients. And if they have Bartonella, instead of a four-day high-dose Dapsone pulse for four days, we use six days. And we pulse these antibiotics every two months, just two-week pulses. And we're finding that somewhere between four to six, maybe seven pulses are needed to kill Bartonella. So it's very hopeful for the Lyme community. Uh, but the reason it's contentious is that even though I've been publishing this, we don't yet have a randomized multicenter placebo controlled trial. And that is really the next step. Once that study has been done, and maybe in Europe, in Italy, maybe there are doctors that would like to participate in this multicenter trial. Once we have that trial, it will no longer be contentious. Then doctors will see what I have been seeing and what many doctors in fact have been seeing is that Dapsone works. So more and more doctors in the United States are using Dapsone therapy. Um, the reason it's not being used yet in Europe, some doctors are using it, is primarily because that, there, again, this political situation in Europe that we don't know what chronic Lyme disease is, but based on studies that were done 16 years ago by the National Institutes of Health in the United States that said that long-term antibiotics don't work, the problem is the antibiotics they used in those studies were not persister drug regimens with biofilm agents. They were just using things like doxycycline and rocephin, which do not really effectively go after biofilms or persister forms. They did not use different therapies that worked against Babesia bartonella. And finally, when they did the study 16 years ago, they didn't look at all the overlapping causes of inflammation keeping people sick. So the 16-point MSIDS model 
that I have been publishing in the scientific literature that's in both of my books, How Can I Get Better? And Why Can't I Get Better? It explains that when people are sick with fatigue, headaches, joint aches, memory problems, sleep disorders, psychiatric issues, it's from inflammation. But the inflammation may be coming from places other than Lyme disease, Babesia, and Bartonella. It can come from, for example, environmental toxins like heavy metals and mold. It can come from microbiome problems in the gut or food allergies with leaky gut and mast cell activation, from sleep disorders. Um, so there's from mineral deficiencies like zinc, magnesium, copper. There's up to six different reasons why you can get inflammation. And there's 10 downstream effects, including POTS dysautonomia with low blood pressure, hormone problems, mitochondrial dysfunction. So the problem is, is it's a complex illness with up to 16 things that can go wrong. And if you're just looking at one thing, just treating Lyme, and you don't look at co-infections treating Babesia bartonella, and you don't look at all of these overlapping causes of inflammation and downstream effects, you're not gonna get patients better. So that's why a multi-center randomized placebo trial, looking at the MSIDS model and looking at persister drugs like Dapsone combination therapy, that is what is needed at this point, and then it will no longer be contentious, and then I'm sure that you will be seeing uh, this therapy used finally in Europe. So the best advice I would give to Italian patients and doctors and therapists who care for Italian patients who are suffering is you should have your doctor read the article that I published in the journal Microorganisms back in September, 2023. It was published six, seven months ago. It has the entire Dapsone protocol in detail as to how you do it with patients. Every drug, every nutritional supplement, probiotics for the gut, lab testing, EKGs. It explains everything that needs to be done for Dapsone combination therapy. And there's going to be a Lyme summit called the Healing from Lyme Disease Summit that'll be June 4th to 10th here in the United States. It's an online free summit. And I have 18 people that will be discussing their experience with Dapsone combination therapy and showing how much better they are. Some are in complete remission and many of them are much, much better. So I would have the Italian patients have the doctors read the study. And if I have a training course that I do for doctors, uh, if they want to get the training course and learn about how we do what we do, it's very easy to watch. It's 15 or 20 hours of uh, uh, Zoom conferences with slides they can watch. But the doctors have to be trained. But essentially, it's something that can be done by any doctor in Italy. Um, and I would just say back up their medical uh, when they're writing up their notes for the patients just write out exactly where they're getting this from, that it has been published eight or nine times in the literature showing it's effective so that they have a medical legal backup for what it is they're doing. But it certainly will be easier, as I said, once the multi-center study is done. But um, that entire protocol of how we get patients better is in the microorganisms, September 23, on uh, comparing longer high-dose dapsone combination therapy to shorter high-dose dapsone combination therapy for the treatment of chronic Lyme disease, PTLDS, and associated co-infections like Bartonella. So it, it is online. It is available to every doctor and every patient, but you have to have an open-minded doctor with compassion um, who has some courage. And again, if doctors need to speak to me about this, I, I've certainly spoken to doctors all over the world about this protocol. Um, they just do need to get some training in Dapsone before they do it.